All right, let's play around with it. All right, we're ready to test uh, setting this up and to see if it works. So I've gone to the code source uh, wiki website, which is where you can get everything you need for one of these and learn more about them and the different versions. There's a lot of different versions of the uh, SCSI to SD. So uh, you're going to want to read this. Keep in mind that I have a version six which um, added a lot of new features, more than I even realized when I bought it. So I was happy to have stepped up to that one, but uh, there are gonna be some things that I'm gonna talk about here that don't apply to the older and less expensive ones. So just do know that. So uh, the first thing is, is I went ahead and downloaded the software, which is again, new for the version of this that I have. So you do need to keep that in mind. But with that downloaded, we can start to look at configuring this. So one of the differences between the below versions and this one is that this supports up to seven SCSI devices. So that's a significant difference. The other ones only supported four. So we are ready to try this out. The software is currently looking for the device. So I'm just gonna go ahead and plug this in. Uh, now I did actually do uh, this without the card installed and do make sure that you uh, have a card in there when you plug it in. It did not like that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and plug it in and the light on the front will turn on and we're good to go. So what we can do is go in here and we can load from the device to see what it is currently set up with. Um, go ahead and close that. Now it looks like the SCSI Terminator was enabled. I don't want that. Um, since I'm going to be using this with like other real devices, I'm actually going to be using a real 50 pin Centronics Terminator with this thing. So I don't need the software enabled Terminator on there. Um, I think parity might be needed for some CD stuff. So there's a lot of cool things you can configure in here, but uh, I just want to do a really basic setup for right now. Okay, this card does not currently have any um, thing on it. So let's go ahead and create a drive. So I think it will actually show a drive though, if I do uh, see here, so F disk dash L. Um, yeah, so it starts out, I think um, by default, it assumes you want a two gigabyte uh, drive on there. And I'm, I'm thinking two gigabytes is probably just a generic, uh, mostly universally compatible uh, size. So. Uh, we want to change that. So we're going to go ahead and make a drive. Um, I want to set this up for my Roland SK88, which only supports 80 megabyte uh, drive sizes. So we're going to just make a 100 megabyte drive. Uh, let's set this to auto. Um, if I remember correctly, I want to set this to 512. You know what? Let's just do uh, load defaults. Okay. Now we have some good defaults to work with. Uh, let's just do that. Okay. Um... Let's leave all of that alone. Um, disable that terminator. And then we can go in here and we can save to device. Okay, it's saving. Let's see if the partitions have changed. No, so I may need to disconnect and reconnect this. Let's try that. Reset it here and 100 megabytes, excellent. So we can see the disk model is uh, SCSI 2SD and I suspect if we change that um, here, uh, so let's do something like W30 drive, just save that for giggles. Save, sure, boom, boom. Ha, okay, well it ran out of, it was probably all the uh, spaces before that it has for some reason, but uh, we can see that that works. So that's kind of cool. Um, now that we have that in there, we can go ahead and try connecting it to the W30 actually, and see if it works. Okay, now this is not going to be easy to see because this is a big keyboard. It's huge um, and getting everything in frame is just really not possible. So I'll interject some uh, shots of the screen over this and uh, we'll just switch back and forth between those. But this is it set up. So the Roland needs to boot off of a floppy disk with the operating system first. Um, once we have that disk formatted and set up, then we can take that out. But right now we need to actually install the operating system for the keyboard onto the hard drive. Now, as I said, I have it connected. 
uh, through there and it has the external terminator on it. Now the only reason that I would use an external terminator like that is if I was going to add additional devices like the SideQuest drive, which I could totally daisy chain over SCSI. I mean, I would just need another cable like this and I could connect the two and this can use multiple drives. So I don't want to forget <laughs> that the active terminator would be on and then try and set it up and it doesn't work. And SCSI's hard enough on its own. I don't need to add uh, other things like that to try and frustrate me. But for now, we're not going to use this. So I'm going to take that off. And let's go ahead and start this up. So the first thing we need to do is turn on the drive. That is ready to go. So now let's turn on the keyboard. Now, as this version of the operating system uh, initializes itself, it will check the SCSI bus and it will show up here in a moment and it will show all of the SCSI IDs that it could find and it detected a hard drive. Excellent. Um, it's actually possible that it could have booted off of that drive. It might be <laughs> technically formatted for this still, but we're just going to go ahead and go through the process. So. Uh, this is a really complicated keyboard. It's a sampling keyboard. That's why it needs an external storage device. So uh, we're not going to get into how and why you would use that on here uh, for now. Um, just know that it is extremely necessary if you don't want to use floppy disks, which trust me, you do not. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over to SCSI check. Um, and then we can see that the hard drive, I think is actually totally happy with the hard drive. That's hilarious. Um, but we're going to go ahead and format it anyway. So we're going to go to utility. Uh, HD format. We're going to format it here. Come on. Insert system disk. Yes. And now we're going to format it. And this process takes about six minutes. So that's just so much fun. <laughs> And there we go. So much fun waiting for this. Um, but with that, I can actually go ahead and eject the disk now and reboot the keyboard. And it should boot from the hard drive. Bingo. And there we go. Booted off of the SCSI 2 SD adapter. I'm going to do something here a little different, though. Um, let's go back to the SCSI check menu and take a look at what we've got here. So this is where we select the drives that are connected. So if I connected that uh, SciQuest drive, I could set it to drive one or ID one, have the um, SCSI to SD set to ID zero and use both of these at once. However, I have pre-formatted a card for the SCSI to SD that emulates four drives. And let's see that on here in action. I have swapped out the card and let's try booting this again now. So uh, I actually went a lot faster than I thought I was going to. <laughs> I think uh, I'll, I'll mention something uh, when we get a little bit farther into this, but it's going to rescan the SCSI IDs like before, except this time it finds four drives. Ha ha. Now it's picking one of these to boot off of and I think it boots off of the Last ID? I'm not sure. Um, it's really hard to find information about this thing that is uh, understandable. The manual is utterly horrendous. Um, but we can see here we have drive IDs 0 through 3, and they're all capacity 80 megabytes. Um, go over to, well, past 4, we get ID error because there are no drives there. Now, the way that this is set up, um, ID zero is a two gigabyte drive and IDs one, two, and three are all 100 megabyte drives. And by the drive size, I mean the size that the SCSI 2 SD software was configured with. So, um, the keyboard can only use 80 megabytes at a time. That's a, that's a keyboard problem. But, um, using this, we can add more hard drives and I could save more samples to the same drive because it's just the one physical drive, but it pretends to be multiple drives. So this really massively increases the capacity of a device like this. Okay, uh, I was going to do this again at the table, but the battery died on my Mac. So let's just go ahead and use a desktop for this. So I'm going to connect the uh, SCSI 2 SD over USB again uh, to this computer now. 
Let's go ahead and see that. And we can see it here. This is a different uh, drive than the one that I did before, but we can see obviously it's there. It's a 200 megabyte drive. This should be one that was formatted by the Roland W30. And that's what I want to do. So I'm going to go ahead and first off, just move into the folder I have over here. Um, now, when you connect the USB interface for the SCSI to SD, a couple of things happen. Um, so for one, uh, let me should have done this before. One thing that happens is that you bring it up in a way where the configuration software can use it. So if I go and load from the device here, we'll see uh, that we have our 200 megabyte partition and there are no others on here. So that is how this one was configured and we can see that here. But the drive partition also shows up over here. Now you may be thinking that the way this works is by partitioning the SD card and then just working as a USB SD card reader, but that's not what it does. So let me unplug it here, okay? And we can see that it has lost the SCSI to SD. And I'm gonna pull out the card and put it into an actual SD card reader. And we should be able to see it now. And there we go, 58 gigs. So we can see that's the card. And FDisk should show partitions below this if there were any. So if I scroll up here, we can see that's what partitions look like in this tool. So you can see there is nothing. So the way that the SCSI to SD card or SCSI to SD works, at least V6, is different. Now V5, um, when you configure a partition on the SD card, the settings utility like this one would save the partition information to the SCSI to SD adapter itself. This one works a little differently. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to DD, I'm going to use the IF of this card, which is SDH. Okay. Come on. Ah. All right. I'm going to output to test.img and then we're going to use a byte size of 512. We're going to get a count of, let's say, four. Um, but I'm also going to skip, all right, um, this number of sectors minus four. So that'll be 188 there. It's 88. Go ahead and grab that um whoops let's do a sudo bingo so we have our file here now i think i have a hex editor installed i indeed do so if we look here in the card we can see that it has put some data at the end of the card related to the SCSI to SD stuff now this is uh there are a couple of things that we can see here so i believe that this contains the partition information and uh, the uh, IDs like the uh, the drive vendor product ID and the serial number. So the version six board stores the partition information in the SD cards, not in the adapter itself. So that is super handy um, because that means that you can just change out what system and what drives you have set up by just changing the SD cards instead of having to go through and reconfigure the software. It makes my ad hoc intended use way more viable, which really rocks for me. Now, one thing I can do here, if I go ahead and eliminate the skip, is we can see what's on the card, actually. When I go ahead and reload, we're gonna see that this was a Roland formatted disk. So the way that the partitions on this work is you give it like a, um, a start and end point um, when you're setting it up, SD start sector, and then this number of uh, bytes per sector, and then the number of sectors that you want it to be, and it'll calculate the sector count based on uh, whatever size you have picked out here. But it will just somewhere in the uh, that end portion at the end of the card save this information for what the size of the partitions it should present are. Um, and then it'll just write the raw data directly to the SD card. So this, the SCSI to SD device itself for all intents and purposes is acting as the 
integrated drive electronics, um, to borrow a term from something that superseded this. Um, so it's acting as the controller and just using the SD card as a raw storage medium. So uh, when you pull the SD card out and put it into something else, you're not going to see the partitions like this. Uh, you kind of do need to run it through the SD or SCSI to SD adapter if you want to see those partitions like the 200 megabyte partition on this one as it is. Now, I believe if we use this with a PC instead of a Roland that uses a really weird format for the drive. Actually, I think the Roland just raw writes to the drive. <laughs> it's not doing like anything fancy. But I think if we set this up with a PC, um, then we can mount the partitions, the devices, the hard drive, virtual disks um, directly as we uh, plug in the SCSI to SD. So let me spend a little bit of time setting that up. I've not had the best luck with SCSI stuff on older systems, but I think I can get this working without too much trouble. Okay, I finally have this uh, working with a Windows PC. So this was entirely too much work and entirely because of this bad uh, Terminator, which I was not expecting. Joke's on me for having uh, disabled the software termination. You can you can play with that now, kitty. Um, so we have the drive uh, connected. So it's provisioned as two hard drives. <laughs> and... Uh, we need to format it. Now, Windows 98 actually does not have a way of formatting drives um, from the GUI. So what we're going to have to do is restart into DOS mode, and then we can take a look at it. All right. Now that we're in DOS mode, we're going to have to use uh, FDisk here. And from this, we can now go and choose our drive right here, and we will see we have two more right there. And I did uh, make each of the two drives on here two gigabytes, so that's what they should be. So let's go ahead and pick drive three, and let's see if we can see any drive info. No partitions. Okay, let's go ahead and create a DOS partition, a primary. Uh, yeah, let's just use the whole thing. Oh, drive letters. Oh, okay. Create the drive letters. It's not formatted. Uh, I might be able to format it from Windows. Um, so we'll see that. Okay, perfect. All right, let's change and add the other one here. So now we're going to pick drive four. Create our partition. Just can hit enter through everything. Check how it looks. It's looking good. Okay. Um, shut windows down before restarting. Okay. So now we need to get back to windows, but, um, it doesn't like doing that for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it'll eventually just blue screen here. Yeah. So, oh, VXD, it's probably sound drivers. Okay, there we are. Now we can go to my computer once it unfreezes. Oh, it's already opening computer. Perfect. Okay, so we can see we have the two additional drives. No capacities are listed because they're not formatted. So let's go ahead and do that. And there we go. We have all of the drives formatted. Perfect. Now on the first one here, I'm going to create a text document. Um, test file.txt and I'm going to put inside of it here is some text. All right, going to save this and we're going to close it. Leave that in there. Now on the second uh, partition, I'm going to let's try making a folder here. Um, let's just say transfer, whatever, doesn't really matter. All right. From there, I'm going to go to my my documents and I'm going to copy over the wallpaper I'm using. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna open that up. We can see that is indeed the background image. 
And no, I don't want IE to be my default web browser. All right, there, we have files on this. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna shut this computer down and let's go look at those files and how this thing reacts when we connect it to a modern system. Okay, I have everything here. I have not yet plugged the drive in. I'm going to do that right now. And I expect this to work a little differently than last time. And it did. So when we plugged in the drive, when it only had W30 um, formatted partitions on it, we saw nothing pop up. But here we have two partitions that are both readable by this operating system. Here is our test file. Here is some text. And we have the other partition that has the folder and the picture on it. So we were able to successfully transfer files to and from the computer using the SCSI 2 SD. Now, again, this is with the whole board plugged into it, the uh, computer over USB, as we can see by it showing that it found it and listing what the firmware revision is. But if I disconnect this, so let me unmount these and then put the SD card in directly like you might think you would want to do. You will find that it does not respond. Oh, interesting. Ah, uh, weird. Okay. So the first partition shows up, but not the second one. I was not expecting that. So I bet if you make a partition that is the full size of the card, then you would probably be able to do it this way. Interesting. We can still do the test. Um, so it's that many sectors here. Let's go ahead and pull off the end of the card here. This is a different sized card, so I'm gonna need to modify this a little bit. Uh, let's see what we've got here at the very end of the card. We do in fact, have the information about the partitions on here. We here we can see the W30 part that I put in there. So that is in there. Um, so that's interesting that it's exposing that. Um, huh, I was not expecting that at all. So that's, huh, weird. All right, well, anyway, you should still use the SCSI to SD board uh, to connect the card and get the data off of it because that that didn't work out quite the way that I thought it would. It is at least if you want to use this as an intermediary uh, file transfer tool, the USB speed on this uh, isn't super great. Let me put the uh, SD card back into the uh, adapter itself. All right, that should be popping up now. And I want to try a sustained write. So we'll see how that goes. I'm going to guess not very favorably. Depending on what you want to do, it may not be the fastest way to write data to and from this. So do keep that in mind. And there is one particular reason that you may want to write data to this. And I'm going to go ahead and try this now. One thing the uh, SCSI to SD can do is emulate a CD-ROM drive. Now I haven't tested this yet, so we're going to just kind of uh, spitball this, see if this works. So I'm going to try and make a CD. Okay, um, so 700 megabytes, yada, yada, yada probably good okay so let's go ahead and save this save to device all right now i'm going to disconnect it and reconnect it okay now over here i'm going to expect to see the 700 megabyte one yep there we are now i believe we just dd an entire disk image over to that so let me find a disk image that would be a good fit here okay we're going to do Beetle.iso here, which I believe should be uh, Beetle Adventure Racing. It's been a while since I ripped that disc. So let's see what happens. The light is solid on the drive. This might take a while <laughs> because it's slow. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just give it a moment and then I'll come back once that has finished.
Okay, well, this appears to have worked. So on here, I have a, oh, we don't want software rendering, uh, an ISO of Beetlebuggin. All right, uh, on the SCSI 2SD there, and it absolutely installed. That is fantastic. Now, we can see it accessing. That is so cool. I don't know how this is going to handle like copy protection and stuff, so I'm sure this is not going to be a be-all, end-all solution, but that is really cool. So, in the end, um, I ended up just DDing the ISO directly to the SD card. I put the SD card in a separate reader connected to USB 3.0 because the 2.0 that the SCSI 2SD does on its own is painfully slow. Um, so I didn't want to uh, sit through that. It was actually writing. Um, so I, I know that it would work given enough time, but I let it run for like 11 minutes. So <laughs> I, I kind of just, I, 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 I wanted to move along. So uh, yeah, it should be possible though to have a mix of uh, CD-ROM devices and hard drive devices at once. So that is something, but man, this is... This is awesome. I'm, I, I've been meaning to rip all of my uh, games to ISOs, but this is some extra motivation now. Cause this is, I mean, oh, that was terrible. <laughs> uh, this is, not only super convenient, this is going to be a lot easier on the media, and it allows me to be bad, like in cases like this, where this is actually still sealed. <laughs> I have a second copy of this game, so I don't have to open up my sealed copy, although I don't have an objection to it, it's just not necessary, unless I want to see what's inside, because I don't actually know what all's in there. But, uh, I was able to install it without needing the disc, so that's pretty sweet. So, the obvious question here, what happens if we eject it? Interesting. How about if I eject again, will it close the drive? Nope. Okay. Don't eject it. All right. I think that's everything that there is to really test on the SCSI 2 SD that I put in here. I wasn't expecting this to be like the be all end all SCSI emulation device, but it is. This thing rocks. I am really happy with my purchase. I mean, it was expensive, but it does way more than I thought it would. And the way that this build came out, I'm exceedingly happy with as well. The external uh, SD card access works perfectly fine. I've not had any issues with it at all. Um, the <laughs> panel mount micro USB for reading and writing to it, perfect. Uh, getting it into standard external Centronics 50-pin connectors was a very, very convenient move. Uh, so I highly recommend that, except that this is these aren't particularly easy to find anymore. Um, but you might be able to lock into one, so just keep an eye out. External SCSI enclosure, that's really what you're looking for. Uh, but yeah, this thing is awesome. Now, there are uh, a couple of other things that I did test that I didn't really cover. Um... I'll just briefly mention them here. So swapping out the SD card while it's on, I tried. It didn't work for me. It's supposed to be able to do hot swapping. I may not be doing it right, or it may have funky drive setting requirements. Um, I didn't really test the throughput too much because, frankly, I don't care. This is more about the raw capability of it, just what it can do, not really about how fast or performant it is. Like I said, this is going to be an ad hoc device. Nothing's going to be set up using this all the time. I'm not even going to use it as an in-between solution to transfer data, really, except for ISOs, now that I know it can do that. That was fantastic. Uh, so I don't really care what the speed is, although this is the fastest version they've ever released. I believe it's up to 10 megabytes per second, and that's limited by the SCSI spec, if I remember correctly. So it should be about as fast as you can reasonably expect. Um... Let's see, uh, some people were asking me on Twitter as I was teasing about this, uh, wondering about using different partition layouts on the cards. Um, as I mentioned, 
that because this is a V6 board, um, the partition information is stored on the cards, as I showed. It's in the last couple of uh, sectors of the data on the card. So switching cards, like in a setup like this, without going back and reconfiguring it over USB, completely viable. On the older versions, you may not be able to get away with that. So uh, just some things to keep in mind. I think that's pretty much it. Um, I haven't had any trouble switching between 32 and 64 gigabyte cards. Um, probably just going to leave a couple of floater cards. And since the partition information sticks with these, I'm probably going to make some custom labels uh, to do stuff with these now that I can, because that's awesome. Um, but yeah, I think that is everything. I'm exceedingly happy with this. It went way above and beyond my expectations. Um, <laughs> I was going to kind of leave this as like a dingy thing, but now I'm going to spend some time after this video and clean it up. It's still not going to look good. It's still yellowed. I don't believe in retro writing, so it's still going to look yellowed, but hey, that's fine. It is a little damaged um, and chipped here and there. So this is never a museum piece. And like I said and demonstrated, this is just a generic case. So this isn't really ruining any kind of important vintage electronics. So I'm I'm very, very happy with having put this together.